Professor Uhlenbeck, firstly, we want to congratulate you on being awarded the Abel Prize for 2019 for your pioneering achievements in geometric partial differential equations, gauge theory, and integral systems, and for the fundamental impact of your work on analysis, geometry, and mathematical physics. You will receive the prize tomorrow from His Majesty the King of Norway. Greatly honored. Thank you. You spent your childhood in New Jersey, and you describe yourself both as a tomboy and as a reader. That sounds contradictory, but perhaps it isn't. I don't believe it is, exactly. Um, I, uh, uh, I, I think now you would just uh, say that I was interested in sports and the outdoors. Uh, tomboy is an old-fashioned word. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I, and I also, everybody in my family read. So, uh, favorite time during the, during, during the week was our trip to the library. Your mother was an artist? My mother was an artist. And, and your father was an engineer? Yes. Were there uh, strong expectations as to what you and your siblings was to do in your later life? Well, uh, yes, there were strong expectations that we would be able to support ourselves. My parents had uh, gotten to get married in the middle of the Depression, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the uh, difficulties of having enough money to live was very much with them. And uh, so they were mostly concerned that we would actually have jobs. And that went for And I think they had expectations of that my brother would actually do uh, more, uh, would, get a, would get an engineering degree as being a good profession and so forth. And w with me, uh, they didn't care so much what I did. You say you were interested in everything, but uh, you also mentioned that Latin was the only hard course in high school. How did you end up with mathematics? I would have thought you went for Latin then. Well, uh, I don't really know myself why I, I was only l lately I got the explanation for myself that Latin was actually the only hard subject I had. It was not something that you could do right away. You really had to work at la translating Latin. And uh, it was also uh, kind of, uh, you know, to be in this tradition of years and years and years of knowledge and to be actually reading something that was written that long ago was exciting even as a child mm -hmm. for me. So uh, I, I did know uh, at, at one point I had to choose uh, my last year in, um, in uh, high school. Uh, I uh, signed up for uh, the honors math course, which was calculus, and it conflicted with the Latin course. So I signed up for something like Spanish. And after one or two classes in Spanish, I went back to Latin and took the regular math course because somehow or other it wasn't the same thing. And, and, but then you, then you enrolled in, in, uh, in, at the university as a physics major? That's right. I, was, I had been turned on to physics by, uh, my father got books out of the library. And, uh, my father was a, a very intellectual person, even though it was nothing to do with his job. And he got books out of the library, and I remember particularly books written by Fred Hoyle. And uh, I read those, uh, I think he read them, too, but I read those books. I, I confess I didn't do all the mathematics in them, but I, I, I saw the mathematics in them. And I read, and I remember books by George Gamow that I found in the library. There weren't very many books on, on math and science in the library at all. So I did, the, my resources were somewhat limited, but I was fascinated by the physics. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I want to, uh, and of course, I didn't even know you could be a mathematician. So uh, that's, uh, so I enrolled in as a physics major. So you, you had some revelation when you were starting at the university, experiences with mathematics? Right. Well, I, I, off, I tell the story all the time. This was three years after the Sputnik went up. And so there were programs all over the country in integrated math and science encouraging students to study math and science. And so there were honors courses in math. And there was, I took a unified course in which I had an honors course in math and an honors course in physics and chemistry. And uh, I just uh, really took to the mathematics. I mean, right from the very beginning, uh, I enjoyed it and I, uh, was caught up in it, and I was—I—I uh, I, I think uh, 
just, I, I was actually very good at it. And, you know, being, w when you're very good at a subject, it also encourages you to go on to study. But I really enjoyed playing with the ideas. But was there an aha moment uh, where you sort of got so fascinated with mathematics? You mentioned something about the derivative first time. That's right. The first time I really saw a derivative, the, 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 the method of, uh, it was actually not the professor. It was a TA for the course who was doing a problem session. We hadn't got to taking derivatives in the class, but he showed us how to take a derivative, and he showed us how to take a difference quotient and take a limit. And I re still remember, oh, I remember remembering by now, but I still remember turning to the, the, my fellow uh, student in there and saying, are you allowed to do that? I mean, I found it uh, just very exciting to be able to do that. And uh, so I, and I remember, I still remember understanding the proof of the heine borel theorem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just remember how, how, you know, little boxes and things like that. And uh, I, 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 was, I was very excited by the experience. And this was at, at Michigan? At Michigan, as a first-year student, yes. And the experience at Michigan, you describe as sort of special, as opposed to, well, you, you could have perhaps gone out other places, but you went to Michigan, and that turned out to be a good it thing. It turned out, well, I ha they had this honors program, and uh, I also, I met, uh, I, I just met the right people, the right things happened to me. My first year at uh, the University of Michigan, I uh, earned pocket by spending money by uh, waitressing in the dining hall. And, uh, and uh, at, at, at the break, I lived in New Jersey, and so I didn't go home for the break, and I was around, and at one of the breaks, I was in an art museum. Well, my mother was an artist, and I've been going to art museums since I was in the womb, essentially, I mean. And uh, I was in the art museum, and I bumped into a professor next to me. Turned out he was a math professor. His name was Dan Hughes. I, I, uh, and uh, he found out who I was and what I did. And first thing I knew that, uh, I think it was the, uh, the, next, the, the next semester, it might even have been my second semester, I can't remember when it was, but the first thing I knew I was grading linear algebra without having ever taken it. So they, I was just taken in. Uh, and you know, I didn't think of it as being anything special. To me, I was just somebody who didn't know what was going on and wanted to learn things and wasn't anybody. But I think I got very good treatment by my math professors. So, so you were actually seen and you were recognized? I was seen and I was, yes. In fact, I think I sat, I took my first graduate course when I was a sophomore. I took the graduate course in algebra and I remember we did the Vetterborn lemmas. And I, I remember I didn't understand the course, but I had the magical, you know, three years later when I came to study for prelims, I looked at the material and I actually could pull it up and understand it three years later. So the, 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 it's amazing what you act, your brain actually does. It's, learning is not linear at all. Anyway, so, but I was already in, in, in advanced math classes as a, as a sophomore. And uh, so uh, I, I, I had, and then I spent my junior year abroad in München and I had beautiful lectures uh, in, uh, and, uh, I took lectures from a Professor Rieger and a Professor Stein. So was that, a, 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 socially, was that a very different experience from what you were used to at Ameri an American university? Well, it, it was, the program I was in was from Wade, Wayne State University, and there were students from all over the U.S. in that program. And I remember realizing at the time how really good my education at Michigan was, because I was there were students in the program from Princeton and Yale and Columbia and so forth, and I was as well educated or better educated, and I was certainly my mathematical background was much better than the few other math majors. So, uh, in the program, so uh, but that that was also interesting because I rubbed shoulders with American students from all different universities, but then. The, the life of a German student was nothing like the life of an American student. You know, I went to the opera, I, uh, I, went to, I became enamored of the theater uh, while I was there. Um, I uh, learned to ski. Um, 
I, uh, I have to think of what I, I, of course, had a German boyfriend at some point and went for long walks in the English Garden because it was romantic. And, uh, and you learned German, and of course. I learned Ger well, I, I, don't, I can't say I know it still, but I, I, I was pretty good at German by the time I finished, yes. And I don't have an ear for languages. After Michigan, after the University of Michigan, you decided to go on with a PhD program right. in mathematics. And you spent one year at the Korang Institute. That's right. And then you moved to Brandeis right. in Boston. And because your, your wife, uh, husband at the time, he was accepted to Harvard. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a graduate student in biophysics. Right, but you decided for Brandeis, and you didn't regret getting to Brandeis, even though you may have gotten into both Harvard and MIT. I didn't apply. And I, I feel I, I, did, I already was aware of the fact that there were tensions around being a woman in mathematics, and I really wasn't interested in them. NYU had a very special record for, for women. Uh, Lippmann Bears had been there and trained a whole generation of women students. Uh, and uh, so NYU had a very good reputation towards women. And uh, Brandeis, I didn't have much of a reputation at all, but I had an NSF postdoc. I, I probably could have gotten into MIT and Harvard. And I just, I, I, some inner radar said not to do that. I see. And then you chose Richard Palais yes. as your thesis advisor. Right. Can you tell me or tell us why you chose him and what was the thesis? Uh, right. Okay. Theme? So, yeah. so I can tell you what. Uh, yes. Well, uh, I took a course from him my first year there. I was a second year student, and I already was noticed because I came in and I passed my prelims. And uh, I think maybe only one of the students that had been there for a year did the, at, so at the time. They all took longer. And so I already, uh, whatever sort of uh, feelings about taking, having women students, uh, they disappeared very rapidly at Brandeis. And um, uh, Richard Pellet gave this beautiful course on uh, infinite he had taught a course on infant dimensional topology the year before, but that year he taught a course on the calculus of variations, which is uh, the basis for his book, A Calculus of Variations and Global Analysis. And I, uh, I, I was just excited by this new field. I understood immediately what global analysis was like. And I was, he was a beautiful lecturer. I still remember the day I went in and asked him what, about the heat equation, and he told me everything I needed to know for four or five years. I mean, uh, uh, for, uh, and uh, so uh, he was, uh, and I was very excited about global analysis. And I remember just making the, the conscious decision I wanted to work in this new field instead of doing a special case of some boundary value problem somewhere. I mean, making kind of consciously a uh, decision to jump in, uh, so to speak. So, so the theme was uh, calculus of variation. That's right. And uh, this was related to or uh, to what is called global analysis. That's right. It yeah. was really calculus of variations from a global and analytic yeah. point of view. What is global analysis? Can you s describe well, that to I, us? Well, I, I think the, the, that uh, global analysis was the change from viewing an ordinary or partial differential equation as a very complicated object with lots of indices and lots of formulas as simple equations in an infinite dimensional space or an infinite dimensional manifold. And uh, the con conceptually, it simplified what you were doing tremendously. And uh, you also, uh, it was also discovered that a whole lot of stuff that you can do in finite dimensions, you can do under the right hypothesis in the infinite dimensions. And of course, the, the typical example would be the Abel Prize winner, uh, well, uh, Atiyah and Singer, who uh, actually at that time proved a theorem about partial differential equations that said a linear partial differential equation of a certain type is it has a kernel and a co-kernel like in finite dimensions and that the difference between the kernel and co-kernel has topologic comes from topology and this was a very exciting uh, discovery and uh, uh, it's foundational to just the change in perspective towards these equations I, I want to to read a quote from uh, what you wrote in your um, uh, article at the Proceedings of the International Con 
Conference, uh, Congress of Mathematics in 1990 in Kyoto, where you said the following, in the 1960s, the subject global analysis developed with explicit goal of solving nonlinear problems via methods from infinite dimensional differential topology. The optimism of the area of global analysis has ultimately been justified, but this did not happen immediately. The problem is essentially in order to, dis to discover properties of solutions of ordinary or partial differential equation which have global significance, it is essential to make estimates. Could you expand on that? Let me use uh, maybe uh, uh, something uh, uh, that I've thought of since I've started doing interviews, and that is, it's a little bit like, uh, it's the question of the large and the small. Uh, it, it, it might be a little bit like the fact that when you uh, paint a picture, you have to have an overall perspective and an overall design and an overall point of view, but the th whole thing will fall apart if you can't do the details. And uh, so just uh, saying that's a person is not the same thing as actually making a person out of it carefully with, with all the, the skill and background and all the teaching that you've had. So the uh, inequalities are the fundamental thing that the, the global picture is made out of, but in order to know exactly the right ones to do, you need the global picture. And examples of that would be, for instance, find minimal surfaces and so on in the, in the higher dimension, etc. That's right. Well, uh, in that case, uh, in that case, uh, that that problem of minimal surfaces uh, is uh, turns out to be uh, what you call a borderline case. That is, in my thesis, I actually wrote down quite a few. Uh, uh, problems in the calculus of variations that satisfy topological, uh, that satisfy a topological problem called Morse theory. They satisfy the, the, the Capalais male conditions and the techniques of manifold theory uh, uh, go through for analyzing the gradient flows and so forth. But uh, the problem is, is that those were made up problems. And uh, the problem is, is that now you come down to a problem that you really want to solve and you say, uh-oh, well, in the case of geodesics, it's palais male and all the infinite dimensional stuff goes over beautifully just like that, like clockwork. But of course, we knew how to do geodesics. We just approximated them by broken, uh, broken curves and reduced it to a finite dimensional problem. So the question is, what, what good is it if it doesn't solve the problem we want to do? And so my observation was is that if you took the equation that you need to minimize to get a minimal sphere and you add a small term onto it, that it suddenly satisfies the palais mel condition and Morse theory is true. Now you look at the solutions of that equation and you let the perturbation go to zero and you look and see what happens to, the, to that. To, to those solutions. And what happens is, is those solutions approach a solution which could be trivial. But there are places in, around in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the surface, I mean, that you're studying, where as the, as, the, as the perturbation goes to zero, all the information collects over that point. And so if you take a microscope and look around that point and make that point, the area around that point, bigger and bigger and bigger, in the limit, you actually can get a solution on the whole plane. And then you, lo and behold, notice that this, in fact, solved your problem for you because the point in infinity can be added. And that's a theorem. Of, and, uh, yeah, and that's a technical theorem, right? And the point in infinity can be added, and you suddenly have found your minimal sphere. So you actually discover that not all the solutions persist, but uh, enough of them persist that you can say something about the problem. Uh, we want to move to, uh, uh, to the following. I mean, John Nash, uh, who uh, won the Abel Prize, or shared the Abel Prize in 1915 with uh, Louis Nirenberg, he intimated to us in the interview we had with him that his paper titled Continuity of Solutions of Parabolic and Elliptic Equations from 1957-58 might have been decisive in him getting the Fields Medal in 1958, except for the fact that uh, Giorgio, an Italian mathematician, mm -hmm. independently 
had to prove the same result at about the same time. That's right. In 1977, you published a paper in Acta Mathematica, a prestigious math journal, uh, with the title Regularity for a Class of Nonlinear Elliptic Systems. And in the introduction, you say that the results in the paper are an extension of the Nash, the Georgia, Moser results. Tell us about this paper and its genesis. Also, the mathematical community took notice and your paper, when your paper appeared. Do you consider this paper your first great paper? Yes, I still consider it my best paper. In fact, it's a very difficult paper, and I, I, I wonder how easy it would be for me to understand it now. So it was a long time ago, right? Uh, uh, more than 40, year, 40 years ago. But um, the, the fact is, is that I had found some uh, calculus of variations problems in my thesis that satisfied this Morse theory. So they had a lot of critical points. But the problem is, is that these, these the, the geometrically simple cases of them were uh, uh, a, a, um, the integrals of a not completely standard sort. And it turns out that, um, that uh, you could uh, uh, find minima, but these minima were not necessarily smooth. These minima could have singularities. And so I, I, I faced the fact that I needed to show these, these minima were actually regular, real solutions, not just these what they call weak solutions. I learned enough of the background in the theory when I was a graduate student to be able to show that the derivatives were bounded. And so, but on the other hand, I couldn't carry it any further. And I worked, I fussed at this problem for a long time. And in fact, if I had only been looking at functions that were minimum at this time, Moser's name is often tacked on because he actually simplified the proof. So it's De Georgie Nash Moser result. And um, it's, so if I had just been a function that you minimized of this sort, that theorem would have actually given the fact that the solutions were regular. Uh, but I had a system that is many functions, and those techniques did, did not a priori um, uh, carry over. But in fact, I actually met Jurgen Moser, and he actually sent me some of his reprints, and, uh, which I read car very carefully. And at some point, I was able to use his Harnack inequalities to actually prove the fact those solutions were regular. Actually, they have critical points where the derivative of the function vanishes, but that, that they were also it was able to see that they were smooth enough, as smooth as you would expect of them. So yes, and that was, uh, and that's I remember uh, uh, Yao S T Yao um, having me come out to California to see him and talk to him about that paper. And that's where I met Yao, and uh, I had actually met Yao as a graduate when he was a graduate student. But I, that's where I met uh, Leon Simon and Rick Shane and Yao in the late we, 70s. We, we'll get back to Yao and to Shane and so on later on. But uh, this paper, uh, particular paper, was on uh, partial differential equations. Yes. Very little bit geometry to do with geometry. Actually, there was nothing to do with geometry. But the techniques that you developed were they important for you later when you wrote the uh, papers later? Actually. No. <laughs> no? Okay. Well, that's, I'm afraid a little bit the story of my mathematical career. I could have pursued it and, and made extensions of it and uh, uh, carried it further. And I did. There were some non-trivial points about making putting more variables in there, and uh, I, I kind of figured out how to do it. But this is my problem. Uh, I, I saw you could do it, and I uh, didn't know wh that those problems were going to be useful. And I don't still don't know whether those prob that problem is useful. And so I didn't pursue it. Uh, but someone else did. Martin Fuchs did, actually. But then, then of course, we, we enter in a different phase in the beginning of the 80s, where you publish a series of highly influential papers. Yes. Uh, these must have been amazing years. What were the conditions that made this possible? I don't really know, because I was getting a divorce. I moved from uh, uh, University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana to the University of Illinois in Chicago. I got together with a new boyfriend, and I taught at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I taught uh, 
two courses a term for three terms, a, uh, three quarters uh, a year. And, uh, I don't, and I think I traveled a lot. And so how I did it, I have no idea. I, I, I find it amazing. Horrible conditions, it sounds like. <laughs> well, I like to say that because young people really think that you have to be at Oxford or something to actually do good work. And I think there's no evidence that that's really true. <laughs> So one of the first papers uh, uh, in this series is the, uh, well, you have several with, with Sachs yes, on the existence of minimal immersions of two spheres. Uh, there you develop a series of techniques, you know, both with respect to regularity, as we've been in connection with, and, and also with, uh, with compactness. And is it, he so I, I couldn't find it in the paper, but is it here? the bubbling idea starts? Well, I asked Jonathan Sachs mm. about where that idea comes from. And he thinks that I actually used it in some talks I gave about this theory. Because the, 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 the technique is in the paper, but I didn't, we, didn't, we didn't call it anything. And I think I only used it uh, kind of in, in talks. But the, the, the name caught on. I, I, uh, and, and, and there you were studying uh, two spheres, embedded two spheres, or balloons in a bigger space. Immerse, yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and modulo the actions of the fundamental groups, so, so to say, strings of the balloons. And you're saying that you can represent these by means of particularly nice balloons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so there were certain, certain technical things there that you encountered that gave rise to these, this bubbling effect. Yes, right. Well, the, the idea is, is you add a small term on. Uh, you can do this to most problems, actually. Uh, you, can, you can add a small term on, and it satisfies the, the pallet mail condition of, uh, th that, um, that, makes, uh, that allows you to construct a Morse theory. And that gives you lots of solutions, okay? That, uh, uh, lots of minima, lots of minima, lots of saddle points. Um, and... Um, the, the fact, uh, 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 so you add the small term on, but now you really want solutions to the original problem, not the approximate problem. So mm -hmm. you want to take this perturbation away. Now, the problem that, that w this phenomena works best in is the, um, uh, is the scale invariant case, meaning that the problem does not really see scale. And so what happens in the limit is, is you take a limit and you get a solution but the solution might actually be trivial. It might be just a map to a point. But you go back and see what happened to the solution, and it goes to the, it, it, it actually converges everywhere except at a finite number of points. And around these points, what happens is it's a scale invariant problem. And so the little region around the point thinks it's just as good as the big plane. And so you have the description of a bubble, of, of a solution, a sphere, actually happening around a little tiny point. And by looking at it with a microscope and, and, and magnifying glass and blowing it up, uh, uh, and I think that uh, I use that term at this point too, blowing it up uh, and kind of undoing that you, you get, you see the bubble that happened at that point and you get a solution uh, on, you get a solution actually on the plane and then you prove that you can put the point in infinity in. So there's that, that's a regularity theorem that you can put the point of infinity in. And so that way you can actually construct quite a few of these immersed spheres. Indeed, a, a generating set of, for, for pi right. two. I think someone else proved that, but that was one of these things that I, we, I, we saw we could do it and we just didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but these bubbles that, uh, that occur, how do you control that there are not infinitely many or, or how? Oh, that's an estimate. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, actually, the answer is is each each bubble needs a certain amount of energy, mm -hmm. and you only have a finite number of energy. So you can sort of you can even count how many if you, if you really wanted to, you could even make an estimate about how many that you could the most you could have. It is hard to choose, but some people hold your two papers from eighty two on gauge theory, uh, removable singularities in young mill fields, and connections with LP bounds on curvature in particular high esteem. Can you give a brief overview? So why are the Yang-Mills equations important? Why is gauge invariance important? Well, the Yang-Mills equations are important because the, the, 
high energy theoretical physicists told us they were important. Mathematicians could very well have written and done and done the whole theory. They just didn't think to do it. So it's one of these evidences where pure mathematics really needs input from outside, from outside the, itself too. Um, it, sometimes it's even another branch of mathematics, but it, uh, the ideas from outside mathematics are actually important in theoretical physics, in theoretical mathematics. But in this case, uh, the uh, first question was that uh, mathematicians uh, actually, uh, I mean, physicists actually uh, got very excited about mathematics, partly because this was an application of the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem to tell you what the dimension of the space of solutions was. And uh, this was something that uh, is it, a topological invariant and it needs global, this needs this beginnings of global analysis to, to answer. And, but they, 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 had, uh, they, they had explicit solutions of a certain type uh, on the four-dimensional sphere uh, they could explicitly write down, and they had some more complicated ones they could write down, and, and they knew they didn't actually know all the solutions of the more complicated sort uh, by the Atiyah Singer Index Theorem. And so they, they had a question about what the spaces of solutions of such things looked like. And uh, the removable singularities theorem comes from the fact that if you take a sequence of these solutions and it does not converge to a solution, you know that it converges to a solution off a particular point, and that point, the same bubbling phenomena, points the same bubbling phenomena happens. And so my theorem about, the first theorem about removable singularities was proving that you could put in that point. Mm -hmm that where, 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 the, where, where the solution failed to converge. And uh, uh, that, that was, and let's see, this, the, second, the second series of papers is, uh, second paper is a little bit different. Uh, the Yang-Mills equations uh, themselves uh, are not uh, elliptic equations. They have a coordinate invariance. It's like you're looking at a plane and you ha you, you're not using Cartesian coordinates. You're using any arbitrary set of coordinates you want to write down. And you still have a plane, and you have all these ways of describing it. And so what happens in gauge theory is, is that you have these, phys these physical objects called uh, uh, connections. Uh, I think they call them fields in, in uh, uh, physics. Uh, we call them connections, and they have this gauge invariance, which means they have a coordinate that's free, and there's way too many of them, and you have to divide out by, it's a symmetry group, and you, it's, you have to divide out by them, and the problem is, is that you have to do something rigid like construct Euclidean coordinates on them. And what I did is, is I showed that uh, uh, under what circumstances you could actually construct these coordinates and uh, then once you have the right coordinate system, you just treat it from standard PDE methods. That's already in the book. So you need, but you need this secondary equation and that's, and somebody had to do it. I mean, I have to say, this is one example where somebody would, if I hadn't done that, somebody would have done it. I mean. We, we're talking now about the um, Yang-Mills equation and the gauge theory. And of course, this is ideas that popped up in physics, but had tremendous influence on mathematics. That's correct. And of course, you know, we all know this famous uh, saying by Eugene Wigner, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences that he wrote in 1960. Now it maybe could turn things around and uh, considering uh, what has happened in global theory, the unreasonable effect that physics has had on mathematics. Ah, uh, no, but that's been since the foundation of, of, well, I don't know about the Greeks, but certainly, the, uh, certainly there was actually no difference between math and physics at yeah, the time of Newton. And, and uh, the division, in fact, the real division between math and physics occurred in the 19th century 
uh, you know, people like Weierstrass started putting, putting all sorts of holes in the arguments that people were doing. They were saying, okay, well, you take a minimizing, you take a sequence of things. Maybe there isn't any minimum. How do you know there's a minimum? You, you physicists, you've been assuming these are all there. And so you, you get a real division of, of mathematics kind of separated itself because it needed a foundation of rigor. I mean, uh, you see, it, it's, it's, it, you, you could see this happening with uh, uh, infinite dimensional vector spaces became very important. Uh, in the theory of calculus of variations, what the ma most important space is called Hilbert space, so that will date that for you. And, and, um, but of course, they're, very, they're absolutely essential in quantum mechanics. And the physicists are the ones that uh, introduced Dirac deltas and so forth. But the mathematics had to separate and make it rigorous before it could actually be a mathematical subject. So you see a real division between math and physics at this point. Math kind of separated itself and made it you know, robust and rigorous. And uh, the physicists weren't real interested in this. And actually, the math physicians stopped being interested in the physics, too. I mean, well, you know, the, that's the, <laughs> it, 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 so. It. And then I think it came back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's sort of interesting, the example you mentioned, because Weierstrass, of course, complaint was about Riemann, assuming that the Dirichlet problem could be That's solved. right. That's correct. And, and, of course, Riemann was more a physicist inclined mathematician than certainly Weierstrass was. That's I see. Well, I, I wouldn't, I didn't actually realize that Riemann, but uh, Riemann was, I wouldn't, I didn't, I don't really know too much about that part of history. Oh, but he, 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 he argued physically for, for I see. Know, things. But then, of course, your, your theories from, from these two papers are taken further. Uh, at this time, you're an established mathematician and you're seeing people like Taubes and Friedman and Donaldson are grabbing hold of the things you're doing and proving things that I, at least I don't see any connections with the, what the physicists originally were thinking about. But now, all of a sudden, you have deep theorems about what form well, manifolds well, are. Well, uh, Taub's PhD is in physics. Mm -hmm. So, and he, he, he wrote as a graduate student a, a book called uh, Vortices and Monopoles mm. with his advisor, mm. Jaffe. So, uh, um, it, it's not it's not true that the, that that all of that was uh, a lot. Uh, some of that is motivated uh, mm -hmm. by uh, the connections with physics. Physics, and in fact, uh, one of the hot subjects uh, topics in that subject right now is is uh, Higgs bundles mm -hmm. and uh, the physicists. Uh, uh, it's physicists in our, my department. Andy Andy Nitsky at, at at Texas was studying them just as hard as any mathematician would. So mm. I, don't, uh, I, don't, I don't know that they've separated so much since, but, uh, uh, but certainly they, they started having a life of their own in mathematics. How do you respond to the following? I mean, the, the conventional or the romantic picture is often that a good mathematician is a person with really outstanding intellectual power who solves the problem through his or her superior genius, and the solution comes as a kind of a bolt of lightning. We know, of course, that this is not the case. Seldom, I, it's more. Well, there's a lot of luck involved. It, there's, luck a of, lot of that, that's a there's a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge about how to take advantage of luck. Right, but it's also important quality is uh, uh, perseverance and the capacity of concentration. Yes. Have you had moments of epiphanies where you, in a flash, saw the solution to problems you had, you had been struggling with? I think, the, the, let me answer your last question first, and the answer is yes. It's, uh, at, at you struggle with a problem, and, and it, get, it can be a period of years, and you suddenly get some insight, that you suddenly see it from a different point of view, and you say, oh, goodness, it has to be like that. And you, you think all along it has to be like that, but you don't see why. And then suddenly at some moment, uh, it can be also a very simple idea, suddenly hits you. And I, I, can rem I don't remember where I was or what I was doing when I had those moments, but I still remember those moments. And, and it was I a mean, moment, bolt of lightning it, moment. It, there's a moment when you suddenly realize that you see how to do it. And then, of course, that's after all the struggle you had struggle isn't right because you wouldn't do it if it weren't a lot of fun. 
but uh, all, all the time you spent thinking about this problem. And then, of course, you've got the problem, which is even worse, is that you've got to write it up. So, I, I mean, but there is this moment right in between when you're, it's really great. I mean, and, and in fact, I do have to say, since I had a similar moment a, a year or so ago about the problem that I had started working on then, that I kept on going back and checking it to be sure it was right. I mean, I remember the moment, but I have to tell you, if it, it's, it's it suddenly everything fits together, you keep going back and checking that it's right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, the, let's see, your, the first part of your question was, oh yes, well, I, I, I think I mentioned this before, but uh, uh, I don't think you can do pure mathematics without the ability to concentrate. I mean, uh, that's, that's where the fun is. The rest of the world fades away, and it's you and the mathematics. And I, I don't think there's any other way to do mathematics. Uh, and of course, that's one of the reasons there are so few mathematicians all, uh, compared to the rest of the population. Well, very special. we don't, uh, I don't think society has, has the will, uh, the will to support too many mathematicians. <laughs> well, that's one aspect, but also to be a serious mathematician requires you have to have a certain uh, perseverance. And, well, and, you and say perseverance, drive. but you know it's escape. Some of us really see it as an escape. But there, there's two sides to this coin as well. Of course, the community is important, and we promise to come back to Yao, who was oh, one yes. of the persons who really believed in you. Yes, that's correct. And, 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 and that, of course, can be crucial as well. Yes. Ya Yao is actually a brilliant mathematician, but he's, he, he was, he's also good at collecting people. He's, also, he's good at inspiring students, but he's also good at, at uh, finding uh, mathematical results that he likes and uh, getting to know and uh, getting the person in, involved in uh, uh, learning their mathematics, has his students learn their mathematics. Uh, and you published uh, this in 1985, you published a paper together with your yes. title on the existence of Hermitian Yang Mills connections in stable vector bundles. That's right. And that work was uh, profound in impact it had on uh, complex geometry. And I uh, cite or quote what Edward Witten declared that Hermitian Yang Mills is one of the major building blocks of supersymmetric string theory. It provides a very elegant existence theorem by reducing to a criterion in terms of purely algebraic geometry. So this was, how did that work with the Yao come about? And, and you, you have already talked about it. How, how, what was Yao's importance for you? I mean, your self-esteem as a mathematician. I knew from the late 70s uh, that uh, Yao admired my mathematics. I mean, in fact, uh, Rick Shane and Yao and Jonathan Sachs and I published essentially the same paper about the minimal immersions of uh, Riemann surfaces, the minimal objects of different shape than a two-sphere, like a torus or a, 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 a two-hole torus or something. And uh, so I already knew, and uh, so he, he approached me and told me the problem. And uh, I, uh, uh, I didn't know anything about the field at all, so uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the problems is, is uh, what the stability con condition means. And, uh, but, uh, and, and also, it's, there's a different formulation in terms of complex geometry uh, than in real geometry. And so I uh, was able to absorb this. And of course, my contribution was is that I did what I'd done before. I added an epsilon in a term that made the problem uh, solvable. <laughs> you proved you solved that problem, and then you took the perturbation away and looked at limits. And again, you have the same problem that, in fact, uh, you, you, you have to know what the limit looks like. And uh, that was the hard part of the paper, actually. You I think uh, said something about uh, two types of mathematicians, one that is thinking linearly, I mean step by step by step and so on, and then you have the more intuitive type of mathematician. Um, 
we, we sort of also uh, very say, talk about the uh, um, theory builder, or uh, and then we have this problem solver. Right. And you rec you belong to the problem solver. I definitely belong to the problem solver. I'm I'm really not much of a theory builder at all, and uh, uh, and in fact I don't even read papers that way. I don't read papers from start to finish. I look at the beginning, I look at the end, I look at the references, I try to find the main theorem, I try to find the definitions, and then I try to find the key lemmas, and then I try to prove the key lemmas. And when I get stuck on the key lemmas, I go back and look at the paper. <laughs> so I, that's a brief, typical scenario for the way I would read a paper. So that might give some idea about how I'm not, a lin not, not and why I don't actually build theory. <laughs> Hilbert said something about um, that uh, problems is the lifeblood of mathematics. And if a field doesn't have good problems, it's sort of going to die. How do you, on this scale, uh, Hilbert sort of put up the panorama, how do you rate global analysis? What's the, does it have the big problems ahead of it? Or how is that, how do you evaluate that? Well, a lot of the areas of uh, areas in which you really would like to understand the problems are are very difficult and quite stuck. That is, uh, I mean, one of the one of the typical examples of w which is very interesting uh, is there are a lot of problems which have to do with an, uh, a complex gauge group. The, the gauge theory and, that I was talking about all had to do with things like unitary groups, special unitary groups. And you can actually look at special linear groups. And so there's an imaginary part uh, uh, of the connection which acts as a Higgs field. And those problems, Cliff Taubes has spent a lot of time trying to understand those problems. The two-dimensional case of Higgs bundles is actually a very hot area of research. Uh, the last five years or six years or so. But uh, that, 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 it's kind of, it's a big open problem to ha how to think of these things because the limits of solutions uh, have singularities and that's always very difficult to understand singularities. So that's a, that's a big open problem. Um, I, I don't, m my answer to you about what the big open problems are is that we, we would all be there if we knew what they were. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't, uh, and I also have not been so active mathematically for the past decade, so I don't, I don't know that I'm the right person to, uh, 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 I've counted on other people to bring me good problems. But in, in 1988 you did make some predictions. Oh dear. Oh dear, yeah, in instants and their rela relatives. Uh, so uh, you had four and you know, five key points where you were thinking that mathematics were moving towards. One was simplicity through complexity. I think That's that right. was about mod July. That's right. Do, do you feel that mathematics has uh, gone in that direction? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think you can regard, there are a lot of, uh, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, the thing is there are a lot of topological invariants uh, that are constructed using uh, models that were originally uh, a, gauge, a, a gauge group and an associated Higgs bundle, mm -hmm. and that, um, th that's very complicated because there are a lot of fields and a lot of different terms. But when you actually write down the equations you're trying to solve and look at the space of solutions, the moduli space is actually very simple. So I think that, that, that that's fair to say that uh, and, and you ask just a question, and after theoretical physics? So, so I, I think you're uh, thinking that inspiration to mathematics will not only come from physics anymore, but from other natural or other sciences. Well, I keep on thinking it ought to be, because uh, certainly the field of mathematical biology has uh, uh, grown, the field of uh, Computer science has lots of interesting aspects that must have mathematical connotations and so forth. But uh, You say something interesting also. I hope that no comments on the place of women in mathematics are even relevant by 2038. So we certainly hope so too. <laughs> yes, right. I, I, I want to say, I, say I, I would 
really hope that. Yeah, that, 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 was, a, that was a good wish. Uh, so, so continuing on that then for a short moment, reflections on your own experience. In an interview with The New Yorker, um, you say, I figured if I'd been five years older, I could not have become a mathematician because disapproval would have been so strong. Could you expand on that? Well, I became a mathematician as a result, in some sense, of the second wave of feminism. Uh, Sputnik and the second wave of feminism. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the point is, is that uh, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique opened up the eyes to the fact that women were not, that all the, a lot of life was not open to women. And so this is the early 60s. I'm already in school at this time. But by the time I actually got into graduate school and then looked for a job, uh, the, the fact that women might do something else was actually in the discussion anyway. I mean, it wasn't, uh, five years before, it probably wasn't really in the discussion that women might, that there might be women doing this in an ordinary way. And uh, so I, I feel uh, the combination of Sputnik and the second, second um, fe feminist movement uh, really paved the way for uh, the doors to open for me. So, uh, and, and five years earlier, I would have missed that. And you say that you were respected by your immediate mathematical colleagues who actually recognized the brilliant mathemat mathematics that you were doing, that the, but that the broader community was less accepting. Do I see a parallel here to how your uh, predecessor, most famous one, Emmy Noether, was treated way, bef way earlier? Does nothing change? Well, something changed, but it changed in the 60s. Hmm. But, but still, still the wider community, uh, not your immediate colleagues, were still very skeptical, you're, you're saying, to, to you being there. Yeah, I, 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 I guess. I, I, I guess uh, I'm going out on a limb now, really going out on a limb, talking about women and mathematics. And of course, um, this is a many faceted uh, issue and question. So cultural factors, prejudices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are not going to go into that. But uh, starting with Emmy Noether, I mean, she certainly is one of the great mathematicians of all time. I mean, in the 20th century, absolutely one of the greatest. And uh, she gave a talk at the ICM, International Con Congress of Mathematicians, in Zurich in 1932. And the next woman that gave a, a plenary talk at this meeting were you in 1990 in Kyoto. That's correct. And then we had the Fields Medal, first women Fields Medal was in 2014, Marian Mirzakani, who won the Fields Medal. Yes. Then comes the, the thing going out on the limb. Mathematics is certainly ma men dominated. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, uh, when uh, Marian Mirzakani got the Fields Medal, she is, uh, there were already 60 medals that had been awarded to men and in the case, of course, with the Abel Prize, you're the first woman among 20 that have got the prize. And now comes this prejudice, which I don't share, but uh, that we find certain uh, attitudes in the mathematical community, and I certainly wanted to respond to that thing. Namely, apart from all the social factors and all the prejudices, has the fact that math is so dominated by men something to do with men being predisposed to mathematics and more generally abstract thinking? Oh, absolutely not. I don't believe that at the moment. That's, uh, um, that's uh, among other things, it's not even clear what you need to be a good mathematician. The more diverse population you have doing something like mathematics, the better robust, the more inventive, the better it is. So I think that that's a completely uh, misguided viewpoint and uh, uh, the fact is, is that there were no women mathematicians because they couldn't get jobs. There were they, they couldn't study, uh, they couldn't support them. They couldn't get jobs. Uh, they, um, they it was hard. They, they had a hard time getting respect from all but their immediate uh, colleagues because uh, uh, and uh, the other women didn't accept it. We even add that, and uh, that 
that changed over the period of years. But, uh, and that certainly has changed. The, uh, the uh, fact that uh, just changing the laws didn't actually make it change overnight. But uh, there's no question in my mind but that you'll see uh, at least, see, I, it, things have really improved at least in the United States. Uh, I, I don't, um, my understanding is, is from, from talking to, to people uh, is that this may, that uh, it, it hasn't improved everywhere and it's still true that women in their 50s have a tough time. But the younger women uh, really are kind of, they, 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 they seem to uh, have found an acceptance and an open, uh, the, the community has changed. The women are more, the younger women are more visible, they're more talkative, they're more uh, uh, involved uh, in the community, and uh, I, like to, I like to think that it, uh, things have really changed, but people don't realize what it was like, well, in the 60s even, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you think uh, really now this, uh, what, it, what they say, that the uh, window ceiling has now been broken? The, the glass ceiling? Glass ceiling. Glass ceiling. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't say that, th that there, are, there aren't problems. Um, it's just a lot better than it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also have to say that I really don't, for example, know what it's like in Norway. You, you voice concern for minorities yes. in mathematics as well. Uh, you, you voiced that at your, when you actually was told that you were right. going to get the prize. Uh, is that something that you have been concerned about for a long time? Is that related to other initiatives that well, you've been taking? Uh, every, actually, quite a few people are concerned about it. I mean, uh, the, the fact is, is that um, perhaps not when I was younger, but when I was, uh, by the time I got up, it, up into the 90s and started trying to help women, uh, one became aware of the difficulties that uh, underrepresented minority uh, uh, students have. I, I, I also knew uh, very well Ephraim Armendaris, who was our chairman uh, at uh, Texas for many years, who was uh, Hispanic. And so uh, I, and, and we, we all, many people are concerned about the difficulties that minority mathematicians have. The question is, is what you can do about it because, and not only that, not everybody is concerned, but I don't, I don't want to say it's not a concern that, uh, the problem is, is that uh, one doesn't know what to do about it. But, but you've had initiatives like uh, the Park City Mathematics Institute and but, well, I mean, the story of Park C, that's how I got involved with the women's program was is that, that uh, you know, when I found it, I thought, this is great. You know, I see other women mathematicians at conferences will have Park City and there'll, there'll, be, a, there'll be a handful of women and they'll all get together and know each other. And the, what ha the problem that happened was is that there, were, there weren't even a handful of women that showed up. It was so predominantly uh, male uh, and, uh, uh, so uh, th that, that's when I became involved with women and basically I got involved because the Institute for Advanced Study gave me money, secretarial support and the prestige to actually try to start a program uh, and, uh, uh, and I had Julian Turn, my co collaborator, and we could do math. Well, we thought we could do math at the same time we were actually doing this organization. <laughs> and we did manage to do a little bit of math through, through, our, through this. But um, so, you know, when, when I see an opportunity, the, the, my, I'm actually not much one for theory, but when I see an opportunity, to do something, then I'll do some, Then I'll try to do something. Uh, when I learned to got the prize, uh, I was of course amazed and uh, uh, overwhelmed and so forth. And but the very next day, before it was even publicly announced, somebody said, "What are you going to do with the money?" And I said, uh, "Money? I haven't thought about that yet." <laughs> but I thought about. I realized what I wanted to do. Very my my immediate thing was is that I want to do something for underrepresented minorities. And uh, so I, I, I thought about it, and I also said, but I don't want, I want to do something that's going to work. I don't want to just go out there and, you know, do anything. And so uh, I, uh, I called up 
my friend Rhonda Hughes, who I knew from the uh, uh, women's program, and I know she's been running an EDGE program. Uh, she and Sil uh, Sylvia Bozeman from Spelman College have run a program for beginning graduate students that's half, uh, half minority women, all for women but half minorities. And so, and they, she has excellent ties with the minority mass community. And so I called her up and talked about her. And so I made the decision that I'm going to give half my prize money away. Uh, uh, a third of that will go to the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, two thirds of that half will go to the EDGE Foundation, who will grant some fellowships to minority mathematicians. Uh, the uh, Institute for Advanced Study, I would like to say, has already uh, matched the money I gave them for this pro purpose. That's very nice, very nice. So we end this by asking the question, what interest, hobbies do you have outside of mathematics? Well, uh, uh, walking in the mountains would go on the top. Okay. <laughs> I still paint a little, or I started to paint a little bit. Actually, I was not so well for a while, and I actually did, uh, I started playing the recorder again, and um, I started doing some painting and so forth, but I've started doing math again. And so um, I find that uh, at this age, uh, uh, I need to keep up my exercise program and do mathematics and uh, keep up with my friends. And uh, I find that life is already very full. Okay. Thank you very much for a very interesting interview and we thank you on behalf of Björn and also on behalf of the Norwegian Mass Society. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And thank you very much for the prize. I mean, I'm deeply honored.